This is Evolutionary Radio. This is your host, Trevor Kuritsen. We have another really good guest lined up for you guys. If you'd like to listen to previous episodes, you can go to evolutionary.org forward slash podcasts. Steve, do you want to do the honors of introducing today's guest? Yeah, today we have a really smart guy, a Dr. Candown, coming in from Regina. I didn't say vagina. I said <laughs> Regina, which is a, a, a town up in um, Canada where they actually drink uh, Canada Dry and they have <laughs> burgers for lunch. So how are you doing up there, buddy? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Regina is the capital of Saskatchewan. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. That's a pretty good deal. You have a population, I think, of 500,000? No, about 250. 250. Okay, well, it's not, it's not that small of a city, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, love, you guys at least got like a Walmart over there, right? We, we have a Walmart and a Costco. That's correct, yeah. <laughs> that, must, that must have been a big deal the day the Costco opened up. Yeah, it's too big of a deal. They're just making a new one. It's terrible. Oh, my goodness. Well, yeah. that's, that's, that's pretty exciting news. So, yeah. Dr. Jim Kando, most of our listeners probably haven't heard of you before. Give okay. us a little bit about, uh, give us a little bit of your background. You know, what got you interested in weight training? What got you interested in researching supplements? What decided you to do a PhD of all crazy things? Okay, well, I did a, a Bachelor of Science in Cell Biology at Acadia University in Nova Scotia back in 94. And some of the biology classes started to spark my interest potentially in the way that the human body responds to exercise. And then I started to take some exercise physiology classes and started to visualize how the body will respond to exercise and or adapt. Uh, and then I did a master's and PhD at the University of Saskatchewan, about two hours north here of Regina, and really lucked out with some prominent uh, researchers, Dr. Darren Burr, uh, Dr. Phil Chilibeck, getting into the area of sports science and supplements. And we were some of the first to publish um, articles on creatine and protein in response to muscle biology. Interesting. And yeah. you're a weightlifter yourself? I am. You said you're going six days a week. About six days a week, yeah, depending on a split routine or how busy I am, it, it can vary with that as well. That's, do you have kids? No, I don't. You don't, well, you, you got a full-time job. That's definitely pretty impressive that you're able to be that diligent with your workout. Yeah, with, I'm an avid golfer as well, so we, we get up about five in the morning, work out, done. I'm here at the office by about eight thirty nine o'clock, no problem. Okay. So in this episode, we want to focus on creatine because there's so okay. much misinformation about creatine. There is. I yeah. remember back in the bodybuilding.com days, if you told someone you're taking creatine, they'd be like, oh man, I don't want to take steroids. That's not cool. <laughs> okay. So, so what, what exactly is creatine? That's, okay. that's a million dollar question. So in an easy layman's term, explain to us what is creatine. Yeah. Well, first off, it's not a steroid but it got that myth because it sort of worked the exact same way as anabolic steroids. So creatine is probably the most researched um, ergogenic aid next to caffeine. And creatine is simply three amino acids naturally found in the diet, primarily in red meat and seafood. But if you take a greater quantity of that, you seem to get an increase in cellular energy, which allows the individual in the weight room, in the track, wherever it is, to exercise at a higher capacity. And if you do that over time, you get greater adaptations to muscle growth, uh, strength, power, so on and so forth. So who would benefit from a creatine supplement? Anybody on the planet would. There's actually good research from embryos to children to adolescents right up to the very uh, frail uh, elderly population. The key though, and this is where one of the big myths would be slayed today is you cannot take creatine and expect benefits if you don't exercise. So this is not an anabolic steroid. The only time that creatine would show beneficial effects is if you add it with exercise and primarily resistance training. Okay. So, so um, let's back up a little bit though. Like the creatine that's found like in a supplement store comes in a tub. Right. Is that synthetic? It's all commercial grade based on three amino acids produced. So they're not extracting anything from an animal product, such as red meat and seafood. It's primarily synthetically or commercially produced. So, you know, why is it so cheap? Be because, um, you know, there's other things that are synthetically produced, whatever, that are far more expensive. What makes creatine so cheap to produce? Well, they can massively produce it in bulk. So that becomes very advantageous for manufacturers and or companies. And again, it's just three easy amino acids that come together to form synthetic creatine. Uh, the issue when other products are combining creatine with other uh, products such as caffeine or proteins, then it becomes more expensive. The big issue for a lot of your viewers is 
to get the amount of creatine shown to be effective, you'd almost have to eat about two to three pounds of red meat or seafood per day. So this is why one of those ergogenic aids has been shown or at least advised to get it from a supplementation standpoint and not through dietary food intake. Dr. Canada, this is a bodybuilding podcast. There's at least a couple of listeners who have eaten that much protein. That eat that on a regular basis, absolutely. Not, not so much now because now, you know, that whole myth of needing, you know, over two grams of protein per pound of body weight has kind of been expelled. But, you know, back 10 years ago, if you're on a bodybuilding forum and you did, and you said that you ate less than like 500 grams of protein, they'd be like, dude, you're never going to make gains. Right. Like it was like, people were taking like a hundred grams of whey protein two or three times a day. Yeah. And to me, that's nonsensical. We have such phenomenal research that you're just going to excrete it down the toilet. So you can maximally use about two to three grams per kilogram or here in Canada, about a pound or a gram, 1.2 grams per pound. The rest of that is being oxidized or you're excreting it. So there's phenomenal new meta-analysis that have come out showing optimal dosage of protein and or macro uh, uh, nutrient uh, uh, delivery. We don't know the maximal amount with creatine. Our lab looks at it from a, a relative basis, grams per kilogram, but the average individual would respond for about five to 10 grams per day. I wanna kind of get into the first big myth and a okay. lot of our, our listeners wanted to know this. Um, a lot of doctors, like a regular doctor, whatever you go to them, you tell them you're taking supplements. You tell them you're taking creatine. They're like, oh, creatine screws your kidneys. <laughs> can you tell me, can you explain why they seem to think that? First um, off, And yeah, the proof ahead. behind it. Go ahead. Yeah. So first off, there's no evidence, and I can't express this uh, uh, enough. There's no adverse side effects from regimented creatine supplementation compared to a placebo. All those anecdotal myths and things you hear about in the news were one-off cases where the individuals take a massive amounts of creatine through dehydrating uh, um, perspectives. Sometimes it can make the kidneys work a little bit harder. So if you have pre-existing kidney disease, that can be filtered through the kidney and liver as well. But again, for the average normal healthy individual, there's no side effects. Uh, the International Society of Sport Nutrition put out a huge position stand last year and they concluded based on all the research. And there's been over 500 studies on creatine that there's no adverse effects. It's the media and the unaided, uneducated individuals who get a hold of these bits of information and think uh, creatine causes ab abnormal effects. From a medical perspective, creatine does cause an increase in filtration from the kidney, but the individual, even with pre-existing kidney disease, can filter that effectively. We've done clinical trials and there's no adverse effects. Will that show up in blood work? There will. We do blood and urine analysis. We look at creatine, uh, creatinine. No, I mean, if, if you do a regular like hormone panel, will it yes. spike your creatinine? Is it called creatinine? How's that pronounced? Uh, it's called crea uh, creatinine. So it's creatinine. the metabolic, yeah. Yeah. Will that it, spike it, that? While it will, in, in, in creatine kinase as well. So, so maybe that could be why that myth has kind of exploded among doctors because their customers will run blood work that'll be elevated and they'll be like, well, what supplements are you taking? They're like, yeah, I'm taking creatine. And they're like, oh my God, you need to stop taking that. It's screwing up your kidneys. Yeah, a thousand percent agree. And the other thing is creatine kinase. If you exercise at high intensity, right after exercise, your creatine kinase is going to be elevated. Whereas the GP says, whoa, that's an indication of a heart yeah. attack. So yeah, there's a lot of most of their clients are just normal Joes. They're not Absolutely. like weightlifters. So for them, that's abnormal, but you're not a normal person. So they can't. So how long do you have to stop taking creatine before you'll, your bloods will be clean? And how long do you have to stop working out for your bloods to be clean so you can get an accurate number? Oh, well, it could be as little as 24 hours uh, post or soon as you stop taking creatine supplementation. The benefits last about four to 12 weeks in the muscle. But in the bloodstream, creatine has a really accelerated half-life, and that can be excreted on a daily basis. What type of results can someone expect with creatine? Because I think a lot of people feel kind of screwed because, you know, they buy a bodybuilding magazine. They see Ronnie Coleman endorsing, you know, some creatine product. Mm -hmm. They buy some creatine. They take it for, like, two or three weeks, and they're like, this is crap. I don't look like Ronnie Coleman. I got screwed. Okay. By far, that all the research will suggest you should expect an increase in muscle mass, muscle strength, endurance, and a big thing is an increase in muscle recovery. So those are the most documented um, research findings when it comes to creatine and resistance training. So if you could put all those together, the individual should get stronger, bigger, faster, 
but also get back to the weight room uh, training at a faster rate because they have less muscle recovery or increased muscle recovery. Now, what about dosages? Because you hear all these different dosages, like you hear cycling, you hear loading. Um, do you recommend that loading phase? Because I remember the old school way was you would load with like 30 grams for like right. a week, and then you'd go to like a maintenance dose. And then they would tell you to cycle it almost because it would sound like a steroid cycle. Like, you know, you do an eight week cycle, take some time off, do another eight week cycle. Do you, do you recommend that loading and cycling? There's three only proven strategies. So to your point about loading, the idea was to take about 20 to 30 grams a day for five to seven days. That's a very effective way of saturating your skeletal muscle. After that, you're simply excreting that extra creatine in the urine. That was very effective. The only downfall was that that's the type of a strategy that led to a lot of side effects. So bloating, nausea, vomiting, GI tract irritation, because you're taking in 10 times as much creatine as you're naturally producing. So that was very effective uh, and it's still used today, but there can be abnormal side effects. The most logical uh, recommendation is to take a lot lower dosage. And here's for your viewers, two strategies. If you only wanna take it on an absolute dose, that means you don't care about how much you weigh, five to eight grams of creatine per day seems to be extremely effective. I prefer the relative base. That means you can compare aging individuals, uh, males versus females. So we put them on the scale. If you're 70 kilograms, our most effective safest dosage is 0 0.1 grams of creatine per kilogram. So if you're 70 kilograms, you're taking seven grams a day. If you're 100 kilograms, you're taking 10 grams a day. That re uh, results in extremely beneficial effects with no adverse effects. For a listener, 70 kilograms is roughly 150 pounds. Right. Sorry, yes, absolutely. And then 100 kilograms is around 220. 220, right. Yeah, 2.2 .2 multiplied by 2.2. Yeah. .2. So who shouldn't use creatine? Is there an age? Or is a 12-year-old too young to use it? Is a 15-year-old too young to use it? Is an 80-year-old too old to use it? Yeah, excellent uh, question. I would probably recommend that no one is uh, refrained from taking creatine. There is, however, very few or limited research in individuals under the age of 18. Usually at an institution to get ethics approval for someone under the age of maturity is more difficult. But again, they're doing great research in Australia with young uh, uh, pregnant uh, individuals, uh, young children as well. We primarily deal with individuals over uh, 18 as well as over 50 is our main uh, uh, research focus. Again, if you put all the information together, there's no adverse effects. So I would be hard pressed to come up with a population or subpopulation where creatine would not be beneficial if they're exercising. Okay, so if you have a young teenager, let's say he's like 15, 16, he's in the weight room mm -hmm. and he wants to take a creatine supplement, you think that's fine? No, uh, we, we need to do a lot more research with that. The Molecular uh, evidence to suggest it could be okay is there, but until we have the research to support that specific population, we don't want to make sure it has any adverse effects during the puberty uh, uh, type of levels or, or the, the upregulation of hormonal levels uh, during puberty as well. So in theory, there's no adverse effects across populations, but those individual subpopulations until they're actually documented or researched uh, still needs to be a lot more work done in those areas. Okay. And there's also this myth that there's creatine non-responders. Yeah. Is that, is that true? Or do you think those people are probably just getting so much creatine in their regular diet, they're probably not benefiting from a supplemental form? Yeah, you kind of answered uh, part of the question. So they're definitely creatine non-responders. And to, to piggyback off the, after your point, one of the main theories is that if you're already getting enough dietary creatine from red meat or seafood, you're probably not going to respond to uh, the supplement. The human has about a maximal storage area of about 160 moles or millimoles per, uh, of creatine per dry muscle mass. So if the individual is already eating maybe one to two servings of red meat or seafood a day, sometimes you'll hear they take the supplement and they don't get an effect. Opposite to that, vegetarians are probably the population that respond the best. They have very low intramuscular creatine levels because obviously dietary creatine is not being consumed. They respond very, very effectively. Um, the other thing is their initial creatine levels in the muscle dictate the response to uh, supplementation. So there are re non-responders, but they usually are based on either uh, dietary preference, vegetarian and or high uh, red meat and seafood eater. What about all the different forms of creatine? I mean, like 10 years ago, you go to the creatine store, there was creatine monohydrate, that was it. 
now you know you got creatine hcl you got create alkaline you got all these buffer forms of creatine what are your thoughts on all those yeah so i can only comment on the research and i can't spread express this enough the only one proven to be effective is monohydrate the rest are basically what i would consider placebo and the reason that the monohydrate is the only one that works is because it's designed to increase water retention a lot of your viewers say they don't like creatine because it increases water retention I would argue that's phenomenal. That means you're a responder. If you retain water, it causes swelling around the muscle fiber to grow. So the only one monohydrate linked to water, it seems to be effective. And all the good research and review stands will out there. You'll get one-off studies that show other types of creatine can be effective. But I can't stress this enough. Monohydrate is the only one proven to be consistently effective across all populations. Talk to us about that water retention. Would that be intracellular or would that be extracellular? So that would be water retention that would blur muscle definition? It does potentially. So one of the biggest side effects of taking creatine is usually an individual will get an increase in body mass of about maybe one to three kilograms in the first week. So it is uh, increasing water retention. At first it's extracellular, but then as it becomes intracellular, our muscle cells and gene love water. And if you swell the cell, it stimulates things called transcription factors, satellite cells to actually do phenomenal molecular work. And that actually causes an increase in uh, DNA activation, RNA, and of course, protein synthesis. So the theory was that creatine only resulted in water weight. Uh, that's been uh, basically disproven many times and it actually increases dry muscle mass. But keep in mind the first maybe one or two weeks, you will experience an increase in water retention and I think that's a really good thing. That means you're a responder to creatine and it will eventually subside and you'll get an increase in uh, dry muscle mass and or strength over time. What about if someone was preparing for like a bodybuilding show, a physique competition, would they want to stop taking the creatine X amount of weeks before? The theory is yes, based on the water retention to, because that might uh, blunt vascularity. So my recommendation is for the competing individuals, if you're going to do that, maybe four weeks out, you really reduce the amount of creatine to maybe about three grams a day. Three grams seems to be the lowest, most effective dosage, and it won't cause nearly as much uh, water retention. And then maybe the week out or even two weeks out before going on stage, they completely take out creatine uh, just because it could maintain some uh, water retention to the muscle. Steve, did you want to jump in? What should our uh, listeners be looking for when they go shop for a creatine supplement? Because uh, a lot of the powders, they have dyes, they have sugar added, they have all kinds of things added to it. Is there, is there you know, is there, what, what should they be looking for so they can get pure, plain creatine and not get creatine mixed in with sugar and all this other garbage? Yeah, so on the label, that's an excellent point. I always recommend to uh, my students, they're looking for 100% pharmaceutical grade creatine that is approved NSF or has a DIN number here in Canada. And I strongly recommend if you're going to buy creatine, make sure that's the only ingredient. So on the back of the label, they might have some maltodextrin or carbohydrate derivatives. If you're okay with that, that's fine. But I strongly suggest or recommend that pure creatine is probably the most effective way to go. There is evidence if you combine creatine with carbohydrate, you get an upregulation to the muscle. There's also good evidence to suggest that you do not need carbohydrate uh, with creatine as well. Talk to us a little bit about all those certifications being like what an NPN number is. Because I just saw a supplement ad where they were advertising creatine and they advertised it as military grade. Okay. I was, I was like, what? <laughs> Where did they come up with that term? I have no idea what that term is, but NSF, uh, the National Sanitation Foundation, they're sort of governing WADA. Uh, they're in line with the IOC. And if you're a CIS athlete or NCAA or wherever it is, you're looking at those proven supplements uh, that have been shown to be completely um, uh, legit or uh, a pure. Um, so in a research lab, we usually have the supplements independently tested by labs to make sure what they're given is exactly what the ingredient says. Uh, there is regulation acts from the FDA. Uh, the Dietary Supplement Act has been around uh, for over a decade. So supplements are regulated per se, but a lot of these products are now combining so many ingredients. We don't know if one uh, ingredient will interfere with the bioavailability of another. Uh, so these pre-supplements, uh, post-supplements, we usually like to look at pure, clean uh, ingredients over time to be effective. 
That's a really good segue. Are there certain supplements you should stack with creatine? Like I've often heard recommendations of using creatine with beta alanine. And okay. then, you know, a lot of people are using creatine before a workout. So they're stacking with stimulants like caffeine. Would that affect the effectiveness or anything like that? Yeah, so uh, I guess we could pick on each one. Creatine and beta alanine co in com uh, combination, uh, that would be advantageous pre-workout. Uh, beta alanine helps buffer hydrogen ions, so the theory, and creatine does the same. So as a pre-workout, that might allow the individual to exercise at a high intensity more often. And some research in, in the U.S. has shown that to be effective. The biggest one is the combination of caffeine and creatine. Um, there was excellent research uh, in, in the 90s to show that if you combine caffeine and creatine together, they totally negate one another. So the theory was that they blunt one another. But if you look closely at the research, that was during acute loading phase. But when the caffeine and creatine were combined in a hot beverage or taken together, there was no blunting effect. So these pre-workout supplements can be effective if they're taken uh, with caffeine and creatine in combination. Uh, the biggest one from a muscle uh, or bodybuilding perspective by far is the combination of creatine and protein. We've shown many times that those combinational effects, you get such cellular growth that I would recommend creatine and protein from a post-exercise period, and then creatine can have some advantageous effects pre-exercise as well. Okay, that's another great question because a lot of people are so confused on when to take their creatine. Okay. Because you read one label that says take it pre-workout, you know, they, another label says take it on an empty stomach, another label right. says take it with food. What are your recommendations or does it even not even matter? It definitely matters. We actually have, have done a series of studies. So in the last two, we looked at pre-exercise creatine on muscle mass strength and we looked at it compared to post-exercise creatine. And this is an important distinction you get no real significant differences if you take pre-creatine or post-creatine. However, we just published a meta-analysis where we looked at the limited amount of studies and there's a small greater effect if you take creatine after you work out compared to before. And the mechanistic reason is if you take it after, the theory is that blood flow is basically causing or going through the muscles during the workout. And as you consume creatine post-exercise, those cells or things that are requiring energy are upregulated or turned on. And so post-exercise creatine might get in the cell quicker. And then for the next subsequent exercise, they'll be there. What about drinking it during your workout? I know you don't have any research on this, but just hypothesis-wise, what if, because I don't think, like creatine doesn't really taste like much. Like it doesn't, so what if you add it to your water and sipped on it during your workout? Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. My master's student right now is in the final uh, stages of his proposal. We're actually going to be looking at creatine intra-workout. They will take in a small amount of creatine after every set, and we'll be starting that in January. My theory is that creatine during exercise would be superior to placebo, but I would speculate it might not have any greater effect compared to pre-exercise or post but until we do that study, again, we'll have the results maybe bring me on next uh, fall to know really the effects of it during. It's a really interesting study. Like it might be more beneficial, but it might be such a small benefit. It's not statistically relevant. Yeah. And then other people say, hey, I can only consume water when I'm working out. Is it really uh, applicable? I think the advantage of having a post-exercise, it's so easy to put in a shake or go home and eat a meal containing creatine. Then you can get on with the rest of your day. Steve, I saw you wanted to jump in. Is there any other myths before we move on that we kind of missed on these subjects that people say? Because again, you know, a lot of people are listening to this and they're right. like, whoa, my doctor said to stop taking creatine. So like, let's, let's say hypothetically you were a doctor and you're taking creatine and they'd say, hey, you need to stop taking this because your kidneys. Like, what, what do you do in that situation? Well, my recommendation is always to listen to your doctor um, because you could have some other type of medical condition or abnormality that's related to the kidney but could be pre-existing from the pancreas, the lungs, whichever it is. So obviously the medical profession will trump anything um, that probably I'm saying. However, a lot of GPs or individuals might know what creatine is, but they might not be up to date on creatine supplementation. So I'd recommend to your viewers, it's easy to Google some of the position stands or meta-analysis reviews on the safety of creatine. And when they do that, you'll see that there's no greater adverse effects whatsoever compared to placebo. What's interesting for our listeners, if you go on PubMed and you search creatine, 
there'll be lots of studies on weightlifters, but there'll also be studies on like seniors to try to prevent Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really becoming like a supplement that everyone can take. Yeah. It's now almost a medical supplement. Uh, before, as you mentioned, 20, 30 years ago, creatine was given just to athletes to get them bigger, stronger, faster. And most of our research now is on age related muscle loss called sarcopenia. We have a five year clinical trial. We just wrapped up on osteoporosis in females. But there is good promise in Alzheimer's, uh, people with MS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, diabetes, arthritis. So it's becoming a medical intervention. Um, and that's why it seems to have such popularity in press uh, that it could have uh, medical and or exercise benefits over time. I, I, I just want to say, like, I wonder, too, because so many people are deficient now in minerals right. and vitamins. And a lot of these diseases are caused from, from a lifetime of you know, eating poorly, like eating processed food, eating food out of a box instead of eating like natural foods. So I wonder if this research is kind of picking up on that, 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 that really like if they had eaten like they should their whole life, they wouldn't need to supplement. But since they didn't, you know, they really can benefit from adding a supplement like creatine, which is very safe. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's an excellent uh, point because usually supplements only work if you're deficient in something. If you're, if you're a healthy individual, a lot of supplements are basically acting as placebo. However, creatine is one of those very similar to caffeine where an increase in the dietary intake or supplementation seems to be advantageous. So obviously an increase in dietary creatine can have beneficial effects. We all know with caffeine, you get an increase in dietary caffeine through coffee, whichever it is, you get a stimulatory effect to the muscle. Um, so there are some ingredients that if you're deficient can uh, be purported or overcome with supplements. Uh, and then there's some that can be used for an enhancement or an increase in performance and or health. Talk just a little bit about caffeine because I'd say these pre-workout supplements are probably the number one supplement people are purchasing right now. Right. Do you like pre-workouts? Do you think some have too much caffeine? What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Um, my favorite pre-workout, uh, and I can't remember the last time I haven't taken this, is a large black coffee. A large black coffee has more than enough caffeine to stimulate uh, neuromuscular activation and muscle contractility. So a pre-workout, if it's done effectively, so I'll give you a bit of uh, uh, information that I think a lot of rev or reviewers might not uh, consider. Caffeine should be consumed 60 minutes prior to exercise. If you go a little bit closer, a little bit further, that's fine. But peak plasma caffeine reaches about 60 minutes. So you want to have the maximal amount in your muscle or bloodstream uh, as soon as the exercise belt lasts. Half-life of caffeine is about four to six hours. So the pre-supplement can be effective even if it's taken an hour before. It would cause some potential advantageous effects. Okay. And then when you say a large black coffee, is that eight ounces? Is that 12 ounces? Is that 16 yeah, that would be like for me, a large Tim Hortons or a large Starbucks or a, a, a normal dose. So it'd be about a 12 to 16 ounce uh, coffee, which gives you about 150 milligrams of caffeine. Research suggests about two milligrams per kilogram. So again, if you're 70 kilograms, about 140 milligrams is the lowest effective dose. You can go all the way up to nine, but then you get into some side effects. That's a massive dosage of caffeine. Yeah, that'd be a lot of caffeine. That'd be a lot of caffeine, yeah. Oh my goodness. And then what about cycling caffeine? Do you think that's important for adrenal health? Yeah, so a, a meta-analysis just came out about three uh, weeks ago. Um, the adrenal fatigue is a myth. Um, there's no good evidence to suggest that you get a, a, a adrenal fatigue from dietary supplements and the human body can adapt over time. Uh, but cycling caffeine... It, there might be some small beneficial effects, very similar to people say you should uh, cycle creatine. But if you're a habitual caffeine consumer, you still get greater effects from supplementation. The funny thing is you actually might need more caffeine because you've already adapted to it. And therefore, your receptors basically need more. You have receptors in the muscle as well as the brain. So if you ever started out drinking ca coffee, you might only need a small black coffee. But now you might need the same amount in a large or extra large to get the same stimulatory effect. I, I don't drink coffee. Okay. But, um, I can say like a few weeks ago, um, I had a sip of my girlfriend's Red Bull. Okay. And I never have caffeine. And I swear I could not fall asleep like that night. So I literally from a sip. So there's something there. Definitely. Like if you're, if you are so used to caffeine, you can, you know, definitely it doesn't affect you more than someone like me who doesn't. Right. So, so I mean, there's yeah, something it, there. 
and uh, some new research by Nancy Guest out of Toronto actually just came out about your genetics and genes from caffeine. So some people can consume massive amounts of caffeine and not get any effect. And if you just said, hey, you couldn't sleep, if it was a normal can of Red Bull, half the can is white sugar, and then you add in some caffeine, you're going to get a stimulatory effect. If it was a sugar-free Red Bull, obviously it's the caffeine. Ironically for your viewers, uh, I know it's not specifically on caffeine, but Red Bull is the mildest energy drink. It only has 80 milligrams of caffeine in the entire can. Uh, that's only a small black coffee. We did two studies on Red Bull showing an increased upper body muscle endurance. Uh, primarily when you add in sugar and caffeine, you get a stimulatory effect. Tell us a little why Red Bull is the weakest energy drink. Sorry, say that again. You want to know why Red Bull is the weakest energy drink? No, actually tell me. Its original marketing was yeah. for use in nightclubs. Okay. And obviously combining huge amounts of caffeine with alcohol isn't smart. So they only put in a low dose of caffeine. Right. Because their marketing was originally in nightclubs. Okay. And then when they saw how popular Red Bull became, then companies like Monster and all these other companies kind of piggybacked that and then kind of made like an everyday energy drink. Right. And they bumped up the caffeine. Yeah. yeah and that's why still knows. today, if you go to any nightclub, they'll have a Red Bull fridge. Oh, okay. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> Good to know. Trevor, Trevor, I, I went up to Canada one weekend and that's all Trevor wanted to do is go to nightclubs. I'm like, dude, this isn't my lifestyle. Right. Why, why you want me to go to nightclubs every night? He's, okay. <laughs> Trevor's a hardcore partier. So I don't, I didn't know that. So that's, we, really get a, we got a lot of snow out here in the prairies. We got to do something. Yeah. That, 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 so tell us a little bit about the other energy drinks. I don't drink energy drinks, but a lot of our listeners do. Every time I go to a gas station, I see people walking out with like a handful of yeah. energy drinks like three of them in their hand they gotta have them so tell us a little bit about the others too yeah i mean there's so many out there now it, again to trevor's point it used to be just red bull uh but most you know monster full throttle they're gonna have anywhere between 140 to 200 and some milligrams of caffeine most are sugar free based on individual dietary preferences but when you add in taurine and all these b vitamins and a whole plethora of other ingredients we just don't know the bioavailability or how all those other ingredients interact with caffeine. I will say, based on my recommendation or theory, they're only ever going to work if they have caffeine. So that's probably the main purported ingredient in all these energy drinks is just simply caffeine. Some will have sugar, some will have other taurine or uh, ingredients, but I think caffeine has to be there uh, to be effective. So I mean, one more question on this is I know Trevor wants to move on, but I actually, we actually had a few questions about taurine in energy drinks. Okay. And um, cause I know like, um, you know, a lot of bodybuilders when we use oral steroids, we get pumps. So we use taurine, you know, to kind of offset the pumps. What is the purpose of putting taurine in an energy drink from a medical perspective? Why do they do it? Is it just a filler? I don't get it. But there was evidence of amino acid derivative or compound. So the theory is there, and they usually give you a high dose, a thousand milligrams or even two thousand milligrams. There was some theory in the rodent model that an increase in taurine uh, increased muscle recovery and or helped maintain energy status. So if you combine that with caffeine, that's maybe some of the purported ergogenic aids or ingredients with that. There's also some new research that shows that taurine is the persecutor to GABA. So okay. if you take it with caffeine, it'll give you that feel-good effect. Correct, yeah. And a lot of supplement companies, what they're doing now is they're formulating these pre-workouts. They're putting in a lot of stimulants. Like I'm talking like 300 to 400 milligrams of caffeine. Okay. But then they're also putting in sedatives like 5-HTP. So what it does is when you take a stimulant and a sedative at the same time, you're like super wired from all the stimulants. But then you have that relaxed effect from all the sedatives. So it's, it would almost be like, taking coke and alcohol at the same time <laughs> okay, right? yeah, exactly a lot, of, a lot of sleep supplements have, have those ingredients so that makes yeah. sense they're adding sleep ingredients to something that you know wires you so that's kind of a good synergy i guess well, yeah. and, to finish, and to finish with the caffeine a lot of your over-the-counter um pain medication you'll notice this has have caffeine in it and just because caffeine can have some beneficial effects not only on muscle soreness uh, but perceived exertion of exercise and potentially decreasing pain as well. So Sudafed, things like that, you might come across something that it also contains caffeine. And that's some of the reasons why that's there. Well, there's a pharmaceutical company. I can't remember which one, but they patented something called smart caffeine, okay. which is basically just caffeine and L-theanine. 
And okay. is an amino acid that's found in tea and it's a, it's a mild sedative. It's also found in a lot of sleep products. Right. And they're making a killing because all it is is caffeine okay. and L-theanine. But people recognize that smart caffeine and they're putting it in pre-workouts and stuff. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. If you've ever, like, you probably wouldn't even enjoy it because you take your coffee before your workout, right? So you want that increase. Yeah, energy. exactly. Yeah. Almost like, I don't know if you'd say jitter, but like, you know what I'm saying? Like that, like, okay, I'm ready to go kill it. Yeah. But if you take caffeine and theanine at the same time, you're energized, but you're also calm. Okay. So if you were gonna, so that's the they gear it more to like video gamers. So okay. Then you take that and you'd be really energized, but you'd still be relaxed. So you can go sit behind a computer and you know do research for three hours or something like that. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be. You should get into industry and do some pre-workout creatine uh, supplementation formulations. Yeah, maybe. I don't think I'm smart enough. But maybe. <laughs> Well, I mean, most of, most of these uh, pre-workout formulas that people are formulating, it's just some guy just throwing some random ingredients right. together, hiring a marketing firm, purchasing some really cool marketing ads right. like, on the market. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so what I want to know is you being the expert, how do you yourself take creatine? I always combine it uh, post-exercise. I can't take it before, but it's just in monohydrate powder. And I'll usually, uh, I call it my uh, post-exercise cocktail. So I'll always consume creatine, um, usually with about 40 grams of protein. And I usually add in omega-3 fatty acids as well, because those are the only three that increase something called the mTOR pathway, which is the main driver for protein synthesis. So if you combine those three ingredients, my hope is that it would accelerate muscle hypertrophy and strength over time. I did like a thousand page literature review on omega threes. Okay. Holy smokes. They will, they will do literally everything for you. They pretty much do. Yeah. <laughs> like there, I think I looked at three to 400 studies. I didn't see a single negative one. Right. And I will point out with the omega three, and most have heard it from, uh, you know, heart health and brain health. But when I talk about muscle biology, it seems to be the most effective if you're 50 years of age or above, just because that pathway that stimulates muscle protein synthesis is blunted and omega-3 in combination specifically with protein seems to override that. So, you know, when we talk about the aging process, they almost need double the amount of protein and they probably need double the amount of other ergogenic aids to get the same effect just because the biological process of aging is, is decreasing the response. Well, I think the reason omega-3s are so beneficial is because they signal satellite muscles, but then they also increase muscle insulin sensitivity. Correct. It almost like make everything you, it almost would like turn your muscles into sponges and you'd absorb all the nutrients you eat that much better. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's why there's good theory about that for type two diabetes. If they can open glute four pathways or doorways, not only would they allow uh, hopefully good quality nutrients into the cell, it has a theory to decrease insulin resistance. So I think that's going to be the next line of evolution or research looking at omega-3 by itself or in combination with exercise on type 2 diabetes for sure. So a lot of our listeners are listening to this and they're running right now to like <laughs> the store to get omega-3s. But before they do, right. give, us, give us the ones that are actually are the best ones to get because most of the crap you find in the drugstore is just that crap. Yeah. You know, so like, we were talking about creatine at the beginning. You know, a lot of these creatine supplements have sugar and all this other crap. Give us some good creatine, I mean, uh, omega-3 supplements, and give us some good omega-3 foods yeah. that our listeners should be eating more of. Yeah, I think this is a little bit of reversal because the food will trump the pill or the sy synthetic form every time. There's excellent research out of uh, University of Guelph in Ontario that the bioavailability when you're consuming those super concentrated omega-3 pills of DHA and DPA uh, or, or EPA, um, they can be effective but I strongly suggest food products. And most individuals will consume it from flax, hemp, quinoa, whichever it is. But if you compare the food products, seafood has the highest bioavailability. So herring, uh, the fattier the fish, and salmon seem to be the most purported dietary sources as well. Do you eat sardines? Sardines as well. I'm originally from Newfoundland on the East Coast, so mackerel, sardines, very good. Okay. Mackerel, I right yeah. here, baby. Mackerel. I don't, like, I don't mind the taste of sardines. I will eat them straight from the can. Most people hate them. 
Yes. Do you have any suggestions on how to make them more palatable or just suck it up and put hair on your chest? Yeah, you almost, if, if they're willing to consume seafood and they, they don't have any allergies, choose a seafood source that's going to be milder. So I would suggest salmon, but herring, sardines, mackerel also are very, very uh, highly concentrated with omega-3s. And then, of course, the pill can be a lot beneficial or have some beneficial effects as well. So, again, choose your delivery source. If you don't like seafood, flax, hemp, quinoa, those all have proprietary sources of omega-3. And if, even if you don't like those, the legume family, almonds, any type of nuts that have a high concentration of omega or uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids would be a good source. The downfall is the amount of calories. So it comes to what you're trying to achieve in the run of a day. If it's to decrease mass, you probably can't consume a lot of calories for the omega-3 source, whereas that's where supplements or the food that you're consuming has to have a, a greater bang for your dollar. So if you ask me, seafood seems to have creatine, protein, and omega-3. There's a lot of vegetable products that will have protein and omega-3, but they're lacking the creatine. So that's where a supplement can be advantageous. So you have to do a little bit of playing around with your diet to see what works best for you. Where, where are you getting your fish from right now in Saskatchewan? You probably have lakes, right? Uh, we do have ponds and lakes. I do miss the ocean, but uh, usually just buying it commercially through uh, uh, Costco, stores like that. So I'm a big believer in salmon. Um, I think it's one of the best overall uh, delivery sources for all three of those ingredients I talked about. So when do they, they have, have to the have them, you're probably there buying them out of all the frozen salmon. Yeah, products. the bulk section, absolutely. That's I mean, right. you guys, do you guys actually have wild salmon left in Canada? Because the Atlantic salmon is like pretty much gone. So yeah, you... they'll, they'll bring it in from BC primarily. So you'll get two, you'll get the wild sockeye salmon or the majority is farmed. And farm salmon's okay? Yeah, to my knowledge, there's no difference in the in the the makeup. It's just how they're raised, just like every other uh, product. Um, it'd be fantastic if a a, a, a plant based source had high concentrations of creatine, but it, to my knowledge, there isn't any. Um, so obviously, the beneficial effects of being vegan or vegetarian or having a plant based diet that's usually where creatine, especially, needs to be supplemented. But I mean, if you're taking creatine since it's synthetic, you don't think you're breaking veganism, right? You don't need to, absolutely not. You don't need to. So if you're taking the creatine supplement, you don't need to get it from any other type of food sources whatsoever. Right, right. So I mean, to a vegan, it's okay to have creatine is what I'm trying to say. Well, like, in terms of you're not going to break your veganism by having, even though it's it derived from, you know, you see what I'm saying? I'm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I never, not, they're synthetic, so they're not going against the code of ethics or uh, against vegan. And they respond some of the best because they have such low amounts in the muscle. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Because we had a vegan body I didn't ask them. We had a vegan body right around a couple of weeks, uh, months ago. Do you, you want to know what bonehead thing I did, Dr. Kendo? Yeah. We had oh. uh, we had Tor Washington. He's a vegan pro bodybuilder. Okay. And he came to Winnipeg for VegFest. He was the quick oh. speaker. Okay. So I, I, you know, I had his number and everything. So I was like, hey, buddy, like, I'll come check out your presentation. After the presentation, let's go for a workout. You're in Winnipeg. So, you know, I'll, uh, I'll pick you up. We'll go to the gym. I wore a Canada goose vest to the presentation, oh. but like I like I knew the health benefits of veganism, and I right. and I you know try to eat more plant based meals because I know it's better for the environment. Right. There are some health benefits to it. Right. I didn't know veganism also had to do with like your skin care, what you wear, right. and like the entire time everyone's giving me these evil looks, and I'm like, like what's going on? Like is yeah. there like something in my teeth or something? And then. Right. He's like, dude, what are you doing? You can't wear a can of goose vest. Right. Vest. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's the personal preference, and you're right regarding the diet. Enormous benefits from a plant-based diet. Uh, if anything, they're probably going to be superior for longevity, decreased greenhouse gas emissions, uh, food production, safety of the environment. Uh, absolutely. Going back to your post-workout shake, you said you're taking 40 grams of whey protein. How much creatine and omega-3s are you taking? And then omega-3, is that a fish oil capsule? Is that a liquid? Is that flaxseed oil? What are you taking? Yeah, so again, uh, I take about 8 grams of creatine combined with 40 grams of protein. Uh, the majority of times that actually is a plant-based protein. And I usually combine that with spinach, broccoli, some berries. And then uh, if I can't add in flax with the shake, I will consume those super concentrated omega-3s. 
And the nice thing is I take that immediately after exercise or within an hour because it's just convenient. It's a great time to refuel and recharge the body. And the rest of the day, I'm just trying to eat healthy. So a lot of viewers say, geez, I need to, to work out or have my uh, strategy pre-workout, during, and after. And it can be very taxing mentally. So I think that's, for me, a really simple time to eat, recover, and refuel the body for the next subsequent exercise bout. Especially if you're working out before work. You know, you go to the gym, you come right. back, you pound that shake, and then you're right. off to work for the rest of the day. Yep. So I'll have two or three cups of coffee before I work out, come back, fuel the body, and then I can enjoy the the uh, uh, the day, so to speak. Now, I will say, if you're doing post-exercise, if you're working out twice a day, a lot of our athletes, I think you look at that recommendation every time you work out. So some of your individuals who do two or three days, uh, 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 or three, two or three workouts a day, you got to recover each subsequent exercise bout. So it's not just the very first one of the day. Every time you work out, you need to be looking at a anabolic recovery, so to speak, for the next subsequent exercise bout. What about cardio? So most of the listeners yeah. to this podcast, you know, they're bodybuilders or, or gym bodybuilders, you know, like they have the goals of building muscle and losing body right. fat, but they don't necessarily compete. Mm -hmm. After a cardio session, so like let's say they were getting up, blasting out 45 minutes of cardio, going to work, and then after work lifting weights, would they still take that shake after both the cardio and weight training or just after the weight training? You need actually a higher concentration after the cardio. So the problem is, depending if they're going long duration or if they're doing HIIT training, you might be jeopardizing your carbohydrate or glycogen stores. So post-cardio, you're probably going to need an increase in car or carbohydrate intake, a definitely increase in unsaturated fat and more protein. Because as you know, cardio oxidizes your muscle for protein. Resistance training doesn't. So a lot of individuals who do cardio, they lose mass, they lose fat, they lose muscle or uh, body mass, but some of that mass is muscle because they're actually burning the muscle for energy. So I would ar actually argue that the individual who does cardio, you need heightened protein and or calories post cardio compared to post resistance training. Really interesting. So with yourself, are you training fasted? Are you drinking the coffee and then without eating anything going to the gym? Yeah, that's just my personal preference. But interesting, there's no difference if you're looking at body fat loss, loss or loss between cardio or fasted cardio versus uh, caloric cardio. I personally just like to have nothing in my stomach. Um, if I eat a large meal, sometimes I get a little bit of GI tract irritation. So for me, black coffee is fine, but a lot of other individuals might go low glycemic during the exercise bout. It's just a personal preference. Okay. And then what about BCA, essential amino acid? Like that's a huge trend right now. Everyone's drinking those during your workouts. Do you think those have any merit? It's an interesting thing because it's probably one of the hottest debated topics right now. So branch chain amino acids, if I had to conclude, they have the greatest amount of evidence for potentially decreasing muscle soreness and they can potentially increase muscle recovery. So hopefully a lot of individuals who are consuming branch chain amino acids, which is basically leucine during their workout, they're doing it for that reason or if they're on a, if they're on a hypocaloric diet. However, it's important to note that if you consume branched chain amino acids and you compare the muscle protein synthetic response to protein, a complete protein source, it's only 30% of that. So in other words, if you had to choose between branched chain and protein, you obviously would consume a whole protein source because branched chain only increased protein synthesis by about 30%. But here's the kicker. You can consume those three amino acids until you're blue in the face. You still need the other 17 to make a protein. So my recommendation is obviously com or, uh, select complete protein sources if your goal is muscle hypertrophy and strength. Again, the branch chain can have some small beneficial effects if you're on a low protein diet, a low calorie diet, or if you have heightened amounts of accelerated muscle damage. I love that you said that because that's always been my theory is because okay. You have non-essential essential amino acids, mm -hmm. right? And essential amino acids are deemed essential because you must consume them through diet or supplementation. Your body cannot make them. Correct. So my thinking was always, if I'm just taking the branched chain amino acids, which are only three of the eight essential amino acids, and I'm increasing muscle protein synthesis, but my body can't actually build muscle because it doesn't have all the essential amino acids, wouldn't that almost be like the boy crying wolf syndrome? And wouldn't your body almost like be less sensitive to that muscle protein mm -hmm. stimuli? Yeah, I didn't want to bring it up. You're 100% correct. The theory and that some of the UK researchers have how speculated that if you're consuming high doses of branching during your workout, 
there's something called the muscle full effect and you might desensitize your body's ability to use whole complete protein sources post exercise to my knowledge there's no study that has said the consumption of branch chain decreases muscle mass um, but I agree with you there is theory that if your muscles can only take in so much you might blunt or desensitize their ability to incorporate all 20 amino acids into a protein. Because weren't branched chain amino acid supplements originally developed to increase the protein rating of vegan protein sources? Because they would take a vegan protein source like brown rice or something, which has low BCA content, add the you know BCAs to it, and then it would become a higher biological value. I'm pretty sure that's where like the original research came from. Yeah, and originally, and the theory with that, to your point, is if you're taking a vegan or plant-based protein, if it's a non-complete uh, protein, so it's lacking lysine or leucine or methionine, you do need to increase the amount to get that complete protein source. So the addition of the branch chain to an incomplete protein source, that might give you a complete source. But if you combine like uh, uh, rice or uh, pumpkin or uh, pea protein, as long as that vegan or plant-based protein is complete, there should be no detrimental effects compared to a milk-based protein such as whey or casein. And if anything, you might just need a little bit more, but there's actually good research to suggest now there might not be any difference and you might get a lot more benefits from plant-based proteins compared to animal-based, especially if you're lactose intolerant, the milk-based proteins can have some detrimental effects. For our listeners, do your research. Most plant-based proteins only contain pea because pea is the cheapest plant-based protein you can buy. Mm -hmm. And then on the label, it'll show, you know, 20 grams of protein, but it's not a complete protein source. So you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Right. Yeah. So make sure it says complete protein source or it has a combination of a plant-based proteins that basically create a, a complete protein source. So Dr. Kando, I got one more question for you. Then okay. I'll let Steve ask any questions. Okay. You were in Nova Scotia. I've yeah. never been there, but I've heard it's one of the most beautiful places in Canada. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to move to Saskatoon? Yeah, so I originally grew up in Newfoundland, which I think is even more beautiful, uh, but Nova Scotia is stunning, and I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Phil Chilibeck at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. They were doing a lot of interesting research on dietary uh, uh, nutrition and bone growth, and then when I went there, I lucked into meeting uh, Dr. Darren Burke, who was one of the pioneers in Canada looking at the effects of creatine and resistance training, so I became very fortunate to work with uh, Drs. Chilibeck and Burke and looked at dietary supplements and it sort of paved the way for my uh, career over time as well. So I have one more question and then I'll let Craig, Trevor finish up. We talked about a lot of foods and a lot of supplements. Two, two things we didn't cover though are um, very much our uh, beef. Okay. And I know you touched on red meat a little bit. Tell us a little bit about beef. What kind of beef should people be eating? And then also dairy. And keep in mind, most of our listeners are in the United States where there's very little regulations on the dairy industry. We just had, um, you know, a lot of, you know, the dairy is factory farm and stuff. So shoot, tell us uh, a little bit about those. Yeah, so there is some uh, preliminary studies on beef, especially that if you consume beef in close proximity to resistance training, you actually get an increase in muscle protein synthesis. Uh, and recovery, uh, younger individuals as well as elderly individuals. So beef can be a very effective protein source. Probably what's more effective is the milk-based proteins. If you're tolerant to uh, whey protein and or casein, milk is a very effective delivery agent for shown to be post-exercise period. It's obviously in a liquid. It causes an increase in protein synthesis and the casein protein helps prolong that effect. So the majority of research when it comes to milk-based proteins is focused on whey, and it's been shown to be extremely effective. Casein seems to get the most press prior to going to bed. It sort of prolongs your protein synthetic response for six to eight hours while you're sleeping. So the individual might wake up in a more positive nitrogen balance. Where can I let's just find out more about you? Do you have Instagram, Facebook, things like that? Yeah, I have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and then, of course, on PubMed for all our publications as well. Okay, and your Instagram is just Darren Kando? Yeah, it is just at Darren Kando. Uh, Facebook, again, the exact same. And my Twitter handle, they're all the same. Ironically, no one has my last name, so I can just go with my name. What I was going to tell you off there is that you should have changed your Instagram handle to Dr. Darren Kando. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I can, actually. A good suggestion, yeah. You can. You'll get more, you'll get more followers that way. Okay, good to know. Yeah, I'm new at this, so I'm trying to get as many as I can. Well, it's, you got to sell the sizzle, right? So if you're a right. doctor, 
like like you're a really chill low-key guy like you're just okay. like hey, Trevor, i'd love to do your podcast but you never want to be scared to promote yourself okay so if you're a doctor you got to kind of whore out that doctor certification <laughs> okay good to know because the average per- like if i'm saying hey i have darren kando coming on my podcast they'll be right. like who's that or yeah, if I say, I have dr darren kando they're like oh he must be smart oh okay yeah well i'll probably change that immediately then <laughs> You know where I'm coming from, though, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Because it basically shows, okay, this guy's got at least nine years of university education. He must know something. A little bit, hopefully, but yeah, no, it's good, good advice for sure. Yeah. <laughs> if you ever go to a poker room, do not mention you're a doctor. Yeah, exactly. The first thing that we think at the poker table is fish. Right. There you you're go. A doctor, that's a fish. So don't good mention you're a doctor at the poker table. <laughs> Remember that when I go to Vegas in a couple months. <laughs> Yeah, so before Vegas, put it back to Darren Candle, but then all the rest, put it to Dr. Darren Candle. Exactly. Every day I'll wake up and change. <laughs> For all of our listeners, I will have all of his social media in the show notes, so you can just copy and paste those. Definitely give him a follow. He just started his Instagram page. He's posting some really interesting research. Definitely a good guy. For your host, Trevor Karitson. For my co-host, Steve Smee. And for our special guest, Dr. Darren Candle. This is another episode of Evolutionary Radio. Live your life. Look good doing it. Thanks for listening. Thanks.